Hello students, this is the last lesson on Aldous Huxley's science fiction novel, Brave New World. I am sure in the first three lessons, you have got a fair idea of what Huxley is planning to do in this text. Here we have just four chapters left, chapter 15 to chapter 18. Then we will have a small general discussion. Chapter 15 is a chapter which is full of action. Here a riot takes place. In the brave new world, the motto is stability, community and stability. But imagine this stable society becoming unstable. The person who is responsible for it is John who is no longer called John in the new world, he is called a savage. As you know, savage means uncivilized. So it is almost as though he is uncivilized. Remember in the last chapter, John came rushing out of his mother's deathbed. The mother has just died. He feels guilty. As soon as he comes out, he finds that there are 162 deltas. Delta is absolutely low in the order of their world. Who are the workers in the hospital? They are made of identical twins. You know, all of them look alike. There are 84 red-headed females and there are 78 dark dolicephalic males. These are all scientific terms which he uses. John cannot make out who's who because all the 164 look alike. And what are they waiting for? Exactly at the end of the day, you know, they wait for their salary. But here salary is not paid in money, it is given as soma ration. They are waiting for their soma ration, tablets of the drug. So they are all in a queue, you know, very orderly way they are waiting. John comes and tells them that you should stop using soma. You must not use, it's a terrible drug. You must choose beauty, you must choose loyalty, you must not choose mindlessness. Nobody listens to him because the deltas cannot understand this high philosophy. Then he goes to the subburser, takes the tablets and throws them out of the window. Till now the deltas were very quiet, they did not understand. Now seeing his action, they start attacking him. The subburser calls up Bernard and says, look at the savage, he's created a mess here and everybody is beating him up. The police come. Now when the police come, you know, if there's any problem on the campus, they bring what is called as tear gas. See the irony, they bring soma vapor. So the police come and they say spray soma vapor, everybody is quietened. Then they play a speech, it is called as the anti-riot speech number two. Because it's not a very serious riot, very serious riot, they'll have a better speech. Now this is only mild riot, so they play that speech. The comparison is there. John's speech about individuality, about freedom and beauty, nobody listens to. They become violent by listening to it. By listening to this conditioning anti-riot speech, they become quiet. So in this chapter, we find that Huxley is making fun of the concepts of mental conditioning, democracy, freedom of the individual, all these points he is raising, the issues which he is talking about. And also he is talking about a benevolent autocracy because the Mustafa Mond we will meet in the next chapter, very sweet, very decent, very well behaved, but an autocrat, completely powerful. Now we move on to chapter 16. Chapter 16 is where Bernard and Helmholtz who are supposed to have created this problem with John and all you know the riot etc are called to the house of Mustafa Mond. It is like coming to court, they have come for a trial because these two friends are going to be punished by exile. Both of them have behaved badly, they have created a monster called John they have to be exiled. Mustafa Mond is going to exile them. 
and Mustafa also wants to try out John. Is it possible to convert John? John does not take Soma. He does not indulge in any pleasure. So he is still a savage. Can he be made into a new world person? This is the experiment Mustafa Mon wants to carry out. So they come to his house. A gama butler comes. You know, look at the irony again. It is almost as though it is Regency England. The butler comes and says, please sit down. His Excellency will come just now. The word is used, his fordship. Because Lord is not there. Lord is a very bad word. You know, there is no God in the new world. So they have ford. The term used is ford. You know, borrowed from the manufacturer of the automobile, Henry Ford. Therefore, we find that he says his Ford ship will come just now. The world controller comes and shakes hands with all of them as though they are friends, as though this is a social gathering. It isn't. He has come to punish them. He asks a question to John first. How do you like the new world? John is not scared. He says he hates it. He doesn't like it at all. Bernard gets very frightened because Bernard had brought John. So if John had said, I love the new world, Bernard would not be punished. Bernard is now fearful of punishment. He tries to interrupt by saying, no, no, John loves the new world. Mustafa Mon keeps him silent. Don't talk. Let John answer. John says that why is it that people in the new world are like machines? Why are they not like human beings? Why don't you allow them to read? Mustafa Mond quotes Shakespeare. John is shocked. Nobody in the new world knows Shakespeare. This man knows. He shows on his bookshelf, the Bible is there. You know, then the intimation, the, the imitation of Christ is there. Then varieties of religious experience. These books are not there in the new world. Why Mustafa Mond has it? He says, I am the world controller. I read these books and I understand. But the people of the new world cannot understand. Therefore, I don't give it to them. I have taken away their right to be, you know, their right to art and literature because I have given them happiness and stability. He says, don't feel bad. They want happiness and stability. At this point, he says that I will talk to John more. But before that, I want to give exile to you. So both Helmholtz and Bernard are exiled to Iceland. Bernard goes with a lot of crying. He says, he grovels. He says, I don't want to go. But Helmholtz is very happy. He says, okay, do I have a choice of where I will go? He goes very happily because he knows that he has subverted the new world. The punishment is given. Chapter 17 also continues the same scene. There is no break in the scene. These two men have gone away. Now only John and Mustafa Mond are there. The world controller and the savage. This is a very crucial scene because Huxley wants to tell you about the contrast between the old and the new world. The brave new world represented by Mustafa Mond, the world controller. The old world the savage reservation or the 20th century world represented by John the savage. They are face to face. Now John asks many questions, you know, one by one. When you read the novel, you'll come to all these questions. It's a beautiful debate. But Mustafa Mond very often becomes the mouthpiece for the novelist. It is almost as though Huxley is using him. He says, we had two experiments. You know, we tried to do experiments to see how it would work. Because John asks a question, since you are manufacturing all babies in the test tube, why can't you have alpha plus? Why do you have the lower castes also? Have everybody alpha plus? He said, don't worry. We did an experiment in Cyprus and we did another experiment in Ireland. In Cyprus, we did one experiment keeping all alphas. But they became, they started becoming completely depressed. Because how can an intelligent man do 
unintelligent work. An alpha plus is highly intelligent. Ask that person to do semi moron work. You know, it is called epsilon semi moron, means no mindless completely. So, they have to do mechanical work. In society, there cannot be equality. Look at the word, you know, Bernard's surname is Bernard Marx. So, this is a critique of Marxism. Can you see? Marxism is not possible because human beings are differently abled. Abilities are different. Therefore, hierarchy is bound to happen. You cannot stop hierarchy. Then John says, why do they work so hard? Why do they enjoy themselves so hard? Why don't they have time for art and literature? He says, we tried an experiment of a four hour working day and we found that there was a lot of problem with this four hour working day. Therefore, the four hour working day is not possible. Work is important as much as work. Remember in the first two chapters we heard, you know, as hard as you work, you must enjoy so much because it is a consumerist society. Unless you enjoy, you won't buy anything. Unless you buy, the people who are manufacturing will not manufacture. The whole society will collapse, economy will collapse. So, they said that do not appreciate nature, because appreciating nature means you are not consuming anything. If you play with lots of equipment, if you use up, you know, the gym and other, remember we had obstacle golf. So, if you have games like that, you are a consumerist, otherwise you are not. So, John says, I think you should give freedom to the people. Mustafa says, no, they do not want freedom, they want happiness, they want, do not want beauty, they do not want art, they want happiness. Happiness means to get rid of disease, to get rid of old age, to get rid of suffering, to get rid of depression. This is what they want, they do not want it. If you choose the old world, you have to have all this. Do you want suffering and old age? Do you want all this? You know, he is depicting all what is the problem in the 20th century. Remember that everybody is trying to become immortal. Millionaires, it seems, pay thousands of dollars for research into immortality. So, Mustafa says that they have it, you know. They have every pleasure and one day they suddenly pass away from life, they go into eternity. They have no suffering, no death. That kind of death as we understand it today is not there. The body gets disintegrated, but that is different. John at the end of the chapter makes an assertion for individuality. This novel is all about individuality. He says, I choose them all. That means I choose suffering, I choose sorrow, I choose depression, disease, old age. Now, we come to the last chapter of the novel, chapter 18. This is where John commits suicide. This is, you know, it was a tragedy I told you in the beginning that John commits suicide. John had requested the world controller to exile him also, because his two friends are getting exiled. So, he says, why can't I be exiled? I also want to go with them. Mustafa Mond refuses. He says, no. You do not have to go there, because I have lot of work with you. Mond was using John as a guinea pig, you know, for experiments. He is not a human being at all. John is an individual, so he cannot tolerate this. Then what he does is, he runs away, he escapes. He goes to a lighthouse in Saray and hides there. Beautiful nature is there and, you know, everything which he requires is there. He enjoys himself. Suddenly, he starts feeling guilty about his attraction towards Lenina, because amidst all this beauty, he keeps thinking about Lenina. So, he says, this is terrible, I should not think of her, she is not nice at all. All my problems are because of my love for Lenina. He takes a whip in and he starts beating himself. Some motorists who are passing this way get lost and they come here. They find Till now, they were searching for the savage, because suddenly the savage has disappeared from London. Now, they find that he is hiding in Surrey. 
So they take a camera, you know, a long telescopic lens camera and they picture the whole thing. They take it and show it to everybody. This is a wonderful spectacle. A man is suffering, beating himself. This kind of pain is not there in the new world. The new world doesn't know anything like depression, pain, suffering, guilt. These are not there at all. Remember you asked emotion. These emotions are not there at all. So when they see it, thousands of people start coming to take his interviews. You know, exactly like the media does today. Anything happens, the media is there. So they all come here because the savage is the most important subject today. Lenina also arrives in a helicopter. She wants to talk to John. She wants to make him sane. He's become totally mad. John does not listen. Just the sight of Lenina, she's so beautiful and all the attraction comes back. But then attraction has a negative impact on him. He takes his whip instead of beating himself. He starts beating Lenina. And of course, somehow Lenina escapes and everybody shouts the chant of the new world that is called as Orgy Porgy. That is the chant, you know, very popular chant in the new world. This is what happens. Nobody can hear anybody. John feels so frustrated that he gives up his promise not to take Soma. He takes a lot of Soma. He becomes completely unconscious. He goes into the coma, typical. When he wakes up from this Soma holiday, he feels very guilty, much more guilty, because now he has no self-respect for himself. Till now, he had a lot of respect for himself that, you know, I am resisting Soma. I am resisting the culture of the new world. Now he realizes that he is given into this temptation. He has no reason to live. Therefore, he commits suicide and this is where the novel ends. First, let us talk about the theme of this novel. Since it is, it belongs to the genre of science fiction, we can easily make out that science is a very important concept in the novel. The theme is science versus the individual. When Huxley wrote this novel in the 1930s, scientific progress was absolutely at the zenith, at its peak. People used to swear by science. Anything which was rational was scientific. Anything which couldn't be proved by science was considered to be unacceptable. That is how religion was not followed. You know, religion was called as the opium of the people. Because religion is sometimes non-rational. We can't call it irrational. We can say it is extra rational. Therefore, it was not scientific. Now, the theme in this novel is science versus the individual. Science on one side and the individual on the other side. Does science make people become like machines? Or does science take away your individuality? These are questions which are being raised by Huxley. The first point is he is cautioning the world about excessive admiration for science. He says, don't be so powerfully attracted with science. Because science is wonderful as long as it is properly used. Misused science is very dangerous. Remember that in 1932 when the novel was published, the atom bomb had not been exploded. The atom bomb would be thrown in the second world war. 39 to 45 was the second world war. So you can see that these prophecies come true. Today we have so many problems with science. If you saw the newspaper of yesterday, you will find that Japan has closed all its nuclear reactors. Why? Nuclear energy is a wonderful energy, but science as positive, science as negative. You can see how the novel says it. A frightening world is pictured as a new world. You know, when you read the title Brave New World, you feel, oh, some wonderful world. But then, apparently wonderful, 
Wonderful means that you have everything. You don't have to work hard. You don't have to do anything. You have, you know, all the pleasures. Your jobs are guaranteed to you. After finishing your BA or MA, you don't have to search because you're conditioned for your profession. No excess population is there. Every man for one job, every woman for one job. Nobody fights with anybody because all of them are your twins. Who will fight? You know, who will go against you? They are all people born from the same test tube, from the same egg and the same fertilization process. So science has done away with the conflicts of society. But conflicts are chosen by individuals. In one of the chapters, John says that a play like Othello, famous play by Shakespeare, cannot be written unless society has conflict and instability. Conflict is important. Challenge is what makes the individual grow. You know, the more challenges you have, the more you grow up, the better you grow, more mature, more capable, you know, survival of the fittest. If you are very rich, then you don't work very hard, you become a, you know, wastrel. If you are very poor, you work hard and you get the highest scores and the best possible jobs. We see this in life every day. So what Huxley wants to say is science up to a point is wonderful. Beyond that point, science should not be encouraged. Individuals have the choice of choosing what they want and what they don't want. In the brave new world, individual choice is denied. Nobody is allowed to think. What Huxley wants to tell you is that human thought is very creative. Human thought is essential. Without it, the life is impossible. Let us move on now to the structure of the novel. We find that the novel has some artistic unity. There are 18 chapters in the novel. 18 is a very significant number. Huxley was deeply influenced by Indian philosophy. So you can explore that also. I am not mentioning much about it. But when you see the novel, you know, in some of the chapters, three, four types of action are taking place together. This is a close-knit structure, which we often call as a verbal montage. Montage is juxtaposition, you know, not a montage of pictures, but of words. This is there in the structure. The manner in which the action is organized, you know, the first few chapters are in the hatcheries and conditioning center. Then we have a few chapters in the savage reservation. Then we come back to the hatcheries. Then we move on to London as a whole. So there is constant movement of setting and the structure varies according to this. Now we come to the style of writing. One of the very significant stylistic devices is the language. Huxley himself wanted to be a scientist, but when he lost his eyesight, he couldn't become a scientist. He came from a family of well-known scientists, so his scientific vocabulary is very powerful. And he used to constantly read science to keep himself abreast. So you will find that vocabulary is extremely scientific. Hypnopedia, for instance, you know, sleep teaching, which we came across in the second chapter. These are typically scientific terms or, you know, when he uses pneumatic for describing a beautiful woman or when he describes, you know, decanting for birth. You can't say in the new world birth. From whatever you take out of the test tube in science is called as decanting. So the children are decanted. They are not born. Like that, the vocabulary is completely scientific. Also, the juxtaposition of the old world and the new world is an extremely important scientific device. The old world is shown as the world of Huxley and the new world is the futuristic world, typical of science fiction. His narration is also metaphoric. Metaphor is a figure of speech for comparison, you know, comparing one thing to another. So he says, this is Mustafa Mond who says it. 
he says that science is like a cookery book. Imagine, every day you can add a new recipe to it. Cookery book, you know, so many uh, items are there in your kitchen. You keep adding them and do some experiment. New dishes you make every day and you write a new recipe in your cookery book. But he says, nobody is allowed to experiment except the head cook. And who is the head cook? The world controller himself. So this is a long drawn metaphor, it is an extended metaphor. Like that is the style of this novel. Then we come to the last point and that is characterization. While telling you the story, I have told you much about the qualities of all the people. You now notice that the important characters are Mustafa Mond, John, Lenina and Bernard. Mustafa Mond's main character is that he is very pleasant, but he is extremely autocratic. John is idealistic, but sometimes he is extremely foolish and very stubborn. When we come to Lenina, we find that she is a typical example of a woman of the new world, but she has some, you know, residue of the old world because she feels sometimes some emotions. She feels, you know, her responses are not at all according to her conditioning. And Bernard is a typical rebel. Although he is an alpha plus conditioned for the new world, he is constantly rebellious. The reason for his rebellion is possibly because while he was decanted, there was an accident and he is born as a cripple. He has a slight deformity in his body. These are characters, but by listening to all the explanations, I am sure you will be able to find many character traits of these four characters. Other important characters are there like Linda and Helbholz. They, but very minor characters. These are all the aspects of the novel which we have to talk about. Do you have some question? Anything which you feel like asking? Will you read the novel now that you have heard all this explanation? Remember that neither you nor I is Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley is a different person. Having read the novel, I explained it for you. Having heard the explanation, now you must feel a great desire to read this novel. Once you read the novel, then you listen to all this explanation again, look at the script once more, then I am sure you will be able to read many other novels by Huxley. Huxley has written wonderful science fiction novels apart from this. Those you read and then you will be able to analyze it like this. Okay? 